Uh, yeah, he had a he had a week off with um they missed two games because of COVID. Because of COVID. So then I'd like to call the meeting. So Mr. Major. Here. Ms. Brown. Mr. Fong. Here. Mr. Butler. Ms. Holcross. Here. Mr. Keller. Here. Ms. Phillips. Here. Mr. Sipper. Here. Okay, so are, are there any discussion points from our January 14th meeting that we need to open up before we get into our presentations tonight? No. I'll move the minutes be approved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Yeah. So we'd like to welcome in our three presenters this evening. Dr. Peter Spiker and Dave Gilmore and Megan Campbell. Um, so Chris will come up to the lectern, please. Hello, Chris. Hi there. Hey, Mike, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Can they? Sure. My first request speaker, Mr. Fong, is back at the camera. I can see him all day long. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Fong. Hello. Hello. Long time to see. Um, thanks for the invitation to uh, join you here tonight and share some of the information about choice of schools. I know. Uh, the two particular interest uh, topics for interest tonight are the so-called stadium programs and some of the things we're doing with our social emotional learning, specifically towards equity and getting our student voices to be heard. Um, I have invited a few people to join me here tonight that have intimate knowledge of those things. Um, you mentioned a couple of them. Dave Dillon, our high school principal, um, and Josh Patterson, who was in our stadium supervisor um, and also junior high administrator. Uh, has worked for years in that program, so they're going to share some information about the stadium program. And then Megan Campbell um, <laughs> is our social emotional learning coordinator. She's going to share some information about our panorama survey and what we've gotten from that uh, to help inform us about our students. So they're going to do a lot of the talking tonight about those programs and probably can answer some questions along the way. And if there are other answers or questions, then we can kind of just all chip in together and do the best we can. Sound good? So, do you want to start with a particular topic, or should I pick? You can pick. All right. Megan. All right, Aaron. I'm going to take my my mask off. Are you guys comfortable with that? Take my mask off while I talk. Especially if you just Well, I appreciate you guys having us come today. My name is Megan Campbell, and I'm the social emotional learning coordinator. Um, in my past, I've been a general education teacher for Troy City Schools, um, and I've been intervention specialist. In Special education supervisor. Um, and I so I um, supervise all the multiple people with disabilities and emotional services groups in Troy. So I've been with Troy off and on um, in different capacities for the last few years. Um, this is the first year for my position as social emotional learning coordinator. It's always been something that's been woven no matter what what job I've been in because it's everything. Learning doesn't happen. It, it's social emotional learning and social emotional competency learn in place. Um, so this year, one of the, the first focuses of my job was to start to look at how can we give students voices? Um, because I think as teachers, we feel like we have, no matter how good how good of rapport we have with our students, I think we, we feel like we know what they're feeling, but really giving them a true voice in, in what they say and what they feel and what they think. Um, that being said, we also, educators, we love data and we make data-driven decisions. Um, so we, um, knew that we wanted to look at social emotional learning competencies and definitely equity and inclusion. We also were, were considering that we wanted to have our um, Troy Online Academy students have a voice. We wanted something that was able to, to be um, a student that has to be in person to be able to give their opinion um, and also our in-person students. So we were looking for a survey that gave us um, student voice because we wanted to be able to address um, achievement and experience gaps. Um, also tracking progress towards district and state SEL and equity and inclusion. 
inclusion expectations, evaluating the effectiveness of equity initiatives, and to drive school improvement. Um, so with all of that being said, we chose to partner with Panorama. Panorama has been, as you guys can imagine, sort of the emotional learning. Um, although it's been around for a while, there's a lot of different companies that are starting to come out with surveys and programs that we, we, kind of, we get inundated with that. Um, and so we have, we wanted a company that had been around for a while, had research-based questions that wasn't just questions that we felt like it was a money-making venture. Um, so we, we went with Panorama. They have um, developed social emotional learning competency survey with Harvard Graduate School of education and everything aligns with CASEL, which is our leading mecca of social emotional learning. Um, but also they had, they were one of the few surveys that had an add-on that was um, an equity and inclusion survey. And so we also um, had our students take part in the equity and inclusion survey. And they, um, Panorama partnered with RISE, called, it stands for Reimagining Integration Diverse and Equitable Schools, which is a project, again, at Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, so to tell you guys a little bit about what we surveyed, we gave our survey back in September into October. Um, this was our first survey and we chose four social emotional learning competencies. Um, as far as their, their research base and, and who that reached, they felt like the questions were appropriate for grade levels third through 12th grade. So social emotional learning competency surveys were taken by third grade up through 12th grade. Um, the vocabulary, things like that. Teachers had ahead of time, they were able to see all the test, or they wasn't test, all the survey questions. They were able to know vocabulary. They're able to help students understand vocabulary in order to make it as equitable as possible. We wanted students to give us their honest voice. Um, it was sent through all student emails. Parents did have the opportunity to have their child opt out if that's what they chose to do. But the four social emotional learning competencies that we chose to measure were supportive relationships, so we wanted to look at how students felt supported through relationships with friends, family, and school personnel. Um, Self-management, so how well students feel like they can manage emotion, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in different situations, which, you know, our students looking at, they, we, they've dealt a lot between being at home, being online, um, hybrid. There's been a lot of different changes in the world, but especially in, in how their learning is delivered. Um, we looked at growth mindset because we want to see students' perceptions of whether they have the, they feel like they have the potential to change the factors um, that are central to performance in school and self-efficacy. So how much students believe that they can succeed in achieving academic outcomes. I think that my favorite part of the surveys, I, I liked looking through the data as it came in, but my favorite part were really the write-in questions. So um, students had the opportunity grades um, third through 12th grade of answering what can teachers or other adults at school do to better support you? And our students spoke so well for themselves to be able to, to explain um, and, and each building, because they, they were classified by building. Um, so that way, you know, when we talk about data, we look at, at building level data, but it was really, it was great to see the trends. And, and as you can imagine, the elementary concerns, they might talk a lot about math and problem solving. Junior high and high school, they're not talking about math. They're talking about a lot of different things that they wish that their teachers knew or, or giving different ways to support. Um, but it was powerful because our students are so well-spoken and they're great advocates for their, themselves. And we saw that through the survey. Um, now, when we look at, at equity and inclusion survey, so that was one survey. So all third through 12th graders took that survey. Now, our sixth through 12th graders took the equity and inclusion. And so the reason it, it was only six through 12th is because that is what the, that's what Panorama can show that they have the appropriate questioning for. Um, so it measured two different areas of equity and inclusion. It measured diversity and inclusion. So how diverse, integrated, and fair school is for students from different races, ethnicities, or cultures. And then it also measured cultural awareness and action. Um, so how often students learn about, discuss, and confront issues of race, ethnicity, and culture in school. And then the two write-in questions that they had were, um, what did you wish your teachers knew about your experiences of race, ethnicity, and culture at school? And what is the most important thing your school can keep doing to support students of different races, ethnicities, and cultures? So again, um, and I think that Mr. Dilbone would agree with me that um, our 6th through 12th graders and, and our high schoolers really, really spoke 
Okay? And they, they gave us a whole wide range of feelings and thoughts and suggestions. And, um, you know, a lot of it, you know, they, they would tell us exactly how they felt and paragraphs of how they felt. So um, I do feel like even though we've only done one round of surveying, we're going to do two rounds. The second will be between April 15th and May 15th, because we also have state testing in there. So we're trying to, um, you know, give some, um, give some flexibility. But we're really, um, we're really excited that students were able to speak and speak their minds and give us a lot of feedback. And again, they're just, Troy City School students are so well-spoken and, and advocate for themselves and their, their classmates and their friends. It was, that for me was the most, power part of, most powerful part of the surveys was really reading through their opinions and thoughts. Um, so what are we gonna do with the results? We've already started doing what we wanna do with the results. Um, I'm meeting right now, building by building, to make sure that we can go on that the counselor and the principal feel very comfortable with going onto the platform um, because there's a lot to it the way that they put all the data in each question we can click on it we can look through how how students responded to it the way panorama does is whether um they just said it was favorable or not favorable um so we realized that on the second round we've got some work to do as a school district to be able to one we want more students to have a voice. So junior high and high school, the response levels weren't as high, lots of reasons because of, um, you know, they're not in one classroom. They, they go to multiple different classrooms. Um, so we have talked about different ways to give more students voice because the high school, we had, I think it was 51, 51, 52% response rate. We wanna hear everybody's voice. We, we don't want, we want to have it as many students be able to, to tell us and give us feedback as possible. So that's our focus for, for a second round with equity and inclusion and social emotional learning competencies, especially in that sixth through 12th grade to be able to have more student voice and for us to have better systems set up in order for all students to have time to take. The surveys only take about 10 to 15 minutes each. They're not long surveys, but they give us the data we need. Um, we're also working hard to identify themes in the write-ins, um, determining strengths and needs of not only the building, but the district. I can tell you in social emotional learning competencies across the district, it was really cool. Every building, um, supportive relationships was high. It was above the national norm. It was high because they do national norm our scores. Um, so it was very high. And um, so that was great to see because I think in our mind, if we don't have relationships, we don't go anywhere yet. So, so the, the supportive relationships were very high um, across the district as far as self um, or social emotional learning competencies, self-efficacy was our lowest. Now we fell um, just a, a little bit lower than the um, national norm, but really having students know that they can do hard things and they were made to do hard things. So that's gonna be some of our focus of, hey, when we come up against hard things, what are some, some skill sets that we have and what are some tools that we have and how can I support you in, in utilizing and accessing those coping skills? Um, uh, we've taken a lot of time to read through all the writing comments and listen to student perceptions. Um, we really want them to continue to use their voice and to be, I think anytime something's new, whether it's staff or students, there can be a little bit of of nervousness um, to be really honest. But I think that, especially through this first time of just being like, no, tell us everything and anything. And, and what are your thoughts and what are you feeling? Because until we know those things, we can't you know, make an environment that's gonna support you in your social emotional growth, learning, make the school equitable for, for all of our students. Um, and we're also really excited when we give it again, we'll be able to watch trends in, in students and buildings to see if what we're doing and what we focus on is working and that it's having the, we, we can think that it's working, but until we measure, until students give us feedback that, that they've grown in their skill sets or, or we're, we're making gains in our equitable practices. You know, so that's what I have about Panorama. What can I answer for you guys? It's excellent that you guys have already put this in place. Yeah. I mean, that, that's very unique. Um, there's lots of places aren't doing it at this point. Right. So what, what, what drove you to do this? What drove us to do? I think that we know, we know our students have a lot going on in the world right now. They have a lot going on within the building right now, um, and I think it was it's something we've been we've been thinking about for a couple of years. And then once my position came about, it was really I felt like we had a person to start to be consistent amongst all of our 
all of our buildings because that can be difficult because everybody's going to do it a little bit different ways there's a lot of different initiatives in the district and so i think it was a way for us to um because if we're going to do it we're going to do it right and not just say we're doing it to do it um so it's it's one of my babies that we just keep you know we keep looking at and revisiting and keep setting up meetings to keep talking about and, and looking um through the data and looking at where we go from here so so will this be something that you'll do each year Yes, and at least twice a that? year. Oh, it's twice a year. Yes, twice That's a year. Okay. Yep. So um, Panorama suggests twice a year. Um, and it's funny because as we go through and we look at students, because we're able to look at who who rated themselves as if we were looking at lower um, supportive relationships, they would say, yep, actually that student was brand new. That doesn't surprise me. And now, and this was just yesterday at Hook, they said, and now, you know, they're a part of this group and safety patrol and they are doing this. And, you know, so they're excited to see what the response is going to be this time because they feel like that student's more connected um, than what they were at the beginning of the school year. Did you see any trends or were you able to see like the diversity or the economics of the individual student that, in, as it relates to efficacy? And Yes, that's a great question. So um, when we put in our, um, when we put in our data, um, our original data sheet of who it's going to send out. Um, we're, we're trying to build uh, comfortability with our staff as well in the, because we don't want staff to feel like this is a, a direct reflection on them of what they right. are or aren't doing. This right. is really to focus on what can we do it as a, as a whole building because everybody in the building matters. It's not just your homeroom teacher. It's not everybody in the building matters. Um, so right now, the way that we're able to look through the data and, and toggle through the data is um, we just put in gender and we put in grade level to be able to look at. In the future, as we build more trust in the survey and, and what we're doing with the survey and, and why it matters so much, we're able to put in a whole lot more information, whatever information we want, whether it's um, ethnicity free and reduced lunch, we can put in 504s, we can put in IEPs, which is where we want to head yeah. to be able to really narrow down and say, okay, what groups are we, you know, our interventions taking place? And, and grabbing a hold of, and who are we not reaching yet? Yeah, that's so, really awesome. Yeah, it will. I'm excited too. Exciting. Well, and what's exciting too is that we are um, the first school in Miami County to do yeah. this. And I actually sat in on a phone call um, or a, a Zoom meeting with Panorama and the rest of Miami County schools um, because I would love to have partnered school districts so that way we can keep talking about how we're looking at data and what we think and where we're going from here as because we do have kids who go to different districts you know we, we it's common for us to get students that transfer in and out of miami county school districts and i think it's valuable no matter where they go to start looking at that I agree so it's good stuff. what's the plan in place to increase participation are you going to incentivize participation you're doing this peer pressure i mean I, it, it's a great part i'm not trying to be critical yeah. but 50 percent mm -hmm. i mean it's like every group here right i mean if or every group dynamic you ever come up with you end up with right. you know certain people that participate right. right and then and, and I think part of what this group's looking for is trying to reach this people that feel maybe disenfranchised or not being heard so yeah how how are you planning to increase participation when I met with the high school and, and you know until you don't know until until you know it so we didn't know what it was going to look like in their email well once we started looking at what it looked like in students email you know whether if they thought it was a spam or they thought because it, it came from something they didn't know about. So I think that by them doing it, but we also had talked about in the high school about during a certain period of the day, because I, I think teachers might've thought, well, they're doing it this time or they're doing it this time. So at a certain period of the day, the entire building has that time, that expectation, no matter where they're at in the building and also working closer with our TOA teachers to be able to make sure that they give time within their school day to. I don't think it was anything other than a time and an assumption that somebody else might have been giving it or that students were more self-directed to take it in their email. So we're going to to do a better job this time of, of making sure like, hey, this period during this day, we're all going to take 10, 15 minutes for, for the survey. Does this count the young people that are in the program underneath? What do you mean? Yeah, do they get the... Are you talking about the stadium? Yeah, the stadium. Yes, all, all of our students get okay. it. Yes, all okay. students, including um, no matter what classrooms they in, they're in, um, separate facility, and any Tri-City school student is getting this. Is the survey um, 
can it be read in multiple languages for any students that struggle? Yes, it already has that. Yep, it already has that. It's a it's amazing what they can do. And it also has, um, when you look at the data and it color codes it, it has, um, if you're colorblind, which we taught, we had um, one of our staff members was like, I'm colorblind, I can't see this. I'm like, there's a button for that. So we pushed it and you could see it. So they, yes, it's already in all the different languages and, and everything is done. The other thing nice about Panorama too, is that we have um, a team of Panorama um, support staff that are constantly reaching out to us. We're in dialogue with what more um, professional development do we need? Let's look at our surveys and, and you know where do we go from here and what's our plan? So we've got we've got a whole team behind us, not just the survey. So, so, so there, there's lots of things that children don't know, right? So when you look at a survey, you find a lot of information. Um, and so there, there's all these things that um, possibly could come up that won't come up in the survey. And so my, my question is, this is this is such a great thing that you're doing. We, we had an entire meeting on just this. So we, I think we definitely would like to applaud you for that. When, when we're looking at the minorities in, in school systems, right? it could be females, it could be black students, it could be Asian students, it could be grad students, et cetera, et cetera. There, there's these, these issues that come up with children who are in classrooms where there's not other children like them in classrooms. So, so does this uncover any of those issues that, that, that those children have? Because that's when you have a lot of impoverished children when, when those issues aren't, aren't being addressed. Yes, I believe it does. As we've looked through the data, um, we've realized that um, with the questions that they're, we're able to, and again, hopefully in the future when we're able to tease out based on some of the different ethnicity groups. Um, but I do feel like it has given us more information. And, and then when you read the write-ins, sometimes we're like, hmm, I wonder why, why it was answered like this. And then when you read the write-ins, it can make more sense because right. students are very, very passionate. And I, I love it. And, and every single administrator, counselor has loved to read the responses because we understand that students are passionate and we're passionate too, that's why we're doing it. So, so teaming up with them is the only way that we're gonna, we're gonna bring success. So what's the long-term objective of the data then? Are you, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, what's, you're gathering it now, mm -hmm. obviously, and you're going to continue to gather yes. it over years. What's the implementation plan? We, and we hope that that needle moves forward. You know, we hope that um, we keep our, our strengths stay high, and we hope that our areas of need continue. We, we start to have student voice show us that what we're doing is, is working, whether it's, um, you know, they feel more value, they feel like their their culture is being represented and celebrated. All of the all these questions we hope that we see more favorable responses than what we did. That was a poorly worded question. Well, how are you planning to where's the data being distributed? Is the school board getting it? Is the administration getting it? Are the teachers getting it? I guess that's more more the question I'm trying yeah. to ask. How, how are we going to take this data mm -hmm. and then make it into something concrete. Hey, we hear, here's the problem, here's what students are telling us, right. and here's our action plan that we're gonna to implement to solve this problem with this erupted because of the survey. Yeah, um, so this year is a, a um, baseline gathering year. Okay. Anybody at any time, so right now I'm meeting with principals and school counselors to be able to talk about and make sure they understand the platform. Because of what I, again, what I don't want is to just send out links to everybody and have them feel like, you know, we're just gonna drag it over to my folder and I'm not gonna do anything with it because we can't pretend like we don't have the data that we have. Um, so right now we are um, gathering baseline data. Um, principals and all the school counselors have access. Any teacher who wants access that feels like they can take that on right now, um, is able to have access because there's also there's something called the panorama playbook which is a bunch of lessons under each different category so it has a lot of resources within it too in starting next year all teachers will have their they already have their accounts set up but it will be sent out we will be monitoring it and in again building by building because the data looks really different and the write-in answers look really different um so as a building it's going to be myself the building principal counselors and, and teachers brainstorming because I, I don't think it's a matter of in the way uh, I do business isn't this is what we're going to do and how we're going to do it it's 
hey, let's look at this. Let's talk about this. What do we know about this? What do we know currently? Um, how do we feel like we can have the most impact and what does that look like? Because each building really, and each building of students has its own strengths and has its own needs. So I'm really taking it of a building by building approach. However, we have this overall district expectation as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I think mine's similar to Todd, but a little bit deeper. So for example, let's say a theme might be a specific staff. Um, are there professional development plans in place to address whether it's relational or you know whatever would come up? Um, have you guys thought about that yet? Or yeah, I mean I think that I think that as we go in and we look, I mean each team in every building is is incredible and and being able to to come up with those plans mm -hmm. authentically and not just the one size fits all. Right. But yeah, I mean, I think that the intent is definitely to address concerns within it and not to just say we have it and we're not going to to look at the truth of what of what students are giving us. But I and I, but I do have to say the right in answers actually has been the other way around. Most of it, I mean, a lot of, because I, I think that there was some apprehension about what students would write in, and it's been pretty cool to see. There's there's several teachers that come up consistently, Their just face. super positive, and even, I mean, even junior high and high school students will speak back to their junior high, sixth grade, or, or elementary teachers as having profound impact on impact on them. So, um, so I feel good because, you know, when staff was a little apprehensive, or not all, but some staff might have been a little apprehensive, but man, the students, now the, they also pointed out some areas of need, but really as far as anything that they've written staff specific, overwhelmingly was positive. So is that shared with the staff? Um, at this time we haven't, like I said, we haven't sent out everything, um, but I mean, as far as like celebrations, yes. I mean, they, they do know that our highest in the district is supportive relationships. They know where we fell in the social emotional competencies as a district and as their individual building level. Um, so if everyone says Dave Dilbone's great, he knows that. I mean, we know that, but does he know? We're not telling him that. No. <laughs> I, don't I, I don't know if that came up, actually. So is that, I mean, it's, it's a long term yeah, plan. You're going to share the good and the bad, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're absolutely celebrating people all the time. I mean, yeah. our students take the time to celebrate, and we actually, we absolutely do too. So. Yeah. Oh, it's good to see that in writing and validated. Yeah. And yes. So I, I just I don't want that side to be lost I either, agree, right? 100%. There. That needs to be sure. Yeah. How private are the surveys? Like, do does it ask for names and stuff? So it is sent through their emails. So when they do respond, now I will say that Panorama has set it up to where they are able to export a sheet of the social emotional competencies responses. Um, so when we go in, we can see a student and um, you know how they rated themselves on a percentage wise. If we wanted to go into the exported Google sheet, then we can see their exact answers. Part of that reason too, is that if they were to write in anything concerning, it's our obligation as a district to, to address that and make sure that their, their safety and well being um, is being considered. Now I will say Panoram, Panorama has made the decision that the equity and inclusion is completely like we're not able to to get individual responses. So um, Panorama will show us who like what um, demographic of students answered what, but they it is an anonymous survey. So okay. yeah, because you could see somebody with a high supportive relationships, but you know it's a very toxic. So there might be room for intervention in the future. Right. That's right. Really cool. But but they also but you know it's also so you know, just because like and that's where I I'm so appreciative of the surveys because what we think of as adults like man they don't have very many supportive relationships but then they're like no I'm all right you know what I mean or we feel like yeah right um, I got a lot of likes um, but they if they feel like what's been eye opening for the counselors as we've looked through the data is students who feel like they have low self rated themselves as low self efficacy or a low growth mindset and they're like there are top performing students I can't believe that this is how they feel about themselves. And man, that opens up a whole new thought of students that we wouldn't have necessarily addressed some of those key social emotional learning competencies that you know if you don't have some of those things, you may not lead to a, you know greatness that you're going to be able mm -hmm. to, to do with with your skill set, so. so it's gone both ways. I don't have any further questions. Um, I, so did you, 
were you selected to run this or did you kind of like speak out and advocate for yourself? Well, so it's interesting. I had, um, so our people services director had gone and it was actually on a snow day of, <laughs> of um, last year. Panorama um, was speaking down at Montgomery County Educational Service Center. And um, she wondered, I was at Miami County ESC at the time, but really, you know, I, I was all in all the Troy buildings and she asked if I wanted to go and I'm not going to lie. There was free lunch there. And I was like, yes, I'll go. Um, I, they had baked potatoes, chicken nuggets, like all of it. Um, but as we went down there and saw when they presented it, it was, it was incredible. And so I, you know, pulled her off like, this is a no brainer. This is amazing. Like we always talk about, man, I really wish we knew, or I really wish that they had a way to communicate, or I wish I could ask questions that seemed non-threatening and got the, got the, you know, the information that I wanted to know out of it. Um, and then, you know, <laughs> then the snowball kept rolling and now I'm the one who gets to, you know, gets to, to do the surveys and help teams and talk about it and, and being in close contact with Panorama. So, so kind of cool how life works out. So. I, pr I appreciate that you did that, you know, advocating for your students is a big deal, especially when so many of them have so many bad things going on in their life and feel like they can't advocate. I think teachers are rock stars. You are a rock star. And you will make an impact if the data is used right, which I think you will. Um, big impact on many students' lives. So thank you for that. <laughs> thank you guys, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I already told these two good luck because she said the I know, right? She really, really good. <laughs> They're the ones who told me to go first. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know, I'm Dave Dillon. I'm the principal of high school. Uh, it's nice to see uh, friends and neighbors and former students and the gamut here, people that I haven't had the pleasure to meet so far. Um, very excited to be here uh, this evening. Uh, so uh, we've invited, as Mr. Piper said, uh, Josh Patterson. Um, the purpose for Josh to join us this evening is he and I have talked a lot recently. Uh, we heard that there were some questions, perhaps even some concerns about some of our programming. Um, we had a chance to look through some of the questions that were sent, some of the bullet points. Um, and, and I'm excited that we're here uh, because as you heard from Megan, uh, we have a really uh, great story to tell. Um, and I think that there, um, this is a program that both of us are very proud of the work that's been done in recent years. Um, and I think there, there, you know, there may have been a time where there were some concerns. Um, and in every program, you should always be looking to make improvements. Um, and we've done that through site visits to other districts, uh, conversations. Um, and then, uh, and I won't take much of the credit because um, Mr. Patterson, um, he, he came the year before I went to the high school. So my last year at the junior high, um, and really took over this program, and, and I'm going to give him a lot of credit, um, just helped us move in a, an extremely positive direction. So as we talk through these questions and, and bullet points, um, you know, made us realize, wow, what, what a story that we do have to tell in terms of access that our students have to things that maybe they haven't always had uh, in being a part of this program and, and why students uh, are a part of this program. Again, um, it's just, it's a really exciting opportunity for us. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on just a couple of things before I turn it over. Uh, the, the one for me that I'm really passionate about, and, and that's that second to last bullet point for those of you, if you saw the, the questions and talking points that came to us, and that's what's the, the goal uh, or purpose of this program. Uh, our, our goal and purpose of, of the program that we offer, and I know that here it's been called the stadium program, and that's because of its physical location. Um, which, by the way, if you haven't had a chance, I, I would invite you to give me a call and set up a time to go visit. It's a phenomenal space. Um, it's it's an air-conditioned classroom uh, with a kitchen. Um, it, it's it, it's a quiet space where our students have a great uh, learning atmosphere. In fact, most of our students um, would really desire to be in a learning environment like that. So um, I think it's a, a great opportunity. But the goal and the purpose of the program is uh, it's to help our at-risk students. Um, and at-risk uh, comes in many shapes and sizes. And many times um, at-risk, you think of uh, underperforming or perhaps even behavior uh, type of problems. Um, and, and I won't uh, speak at length about this. I know Mr. Patterson has some things that he can share, but we have a number of students who are involved in 
um, either TOPS, which that's our Troy online program for success. That's what the program is, is called. The primary program there is called TOPS, Troy online program for success. That's a new name in recent years with a very positive outlook because our goal is success. Uh, we also operate a CBI program and that is career-based intervention. Um, and when we talk about success for our students, we talk about college and career ready. And that is a, a big focus for us at Troy High School. Um, it's always been, but it's even more so now. And so those two programs really give our students an opportunity. Um, and, and, when, and I'll go back to the at-risk portion there. Some of those students are students who haven't had a lot of academic success, need a little bit of additional support, um, perhaps in a different environment. But we're seeing more and more students um, and this ties in nicely to, to the work that Megan is doing uh, through our SEL programming. We have a lot of students who suffer from anxiety, um, social anxiety, uh, being around large groups of students. Um, we have some students that have some medical concerns, and this gives them a safe place uh, to receive their instruction um, in a quiet space. Um, and we have some students that bounce back and forth. Again, I don't want to steal all of his thunder because some of these are bullet points he's going to talk about. Um, but we have some students that do come up. Uh, we have students that participate in extracurricular. So I think um, what you're going to hear tonight is a, a really a great story that we have to tell about that programming. I'm, I'm thankful that you invited us because any time that I can speak about the positive things that are happening at Troy High School, especially if there's concern about them, um, I welcome that opportunity. Um, you know, the racial diversity, all of those pieces. So. Uh, if you don't have anything uh, for me, and I'm happy to chime in at the end, and I told Josh that, you know, that I could I could also assist, but he uh, he'll do a great job and be happy to answer any questions that you guys has uh, you guys have. But I know that uh, he'll go through some of these bullet points and answer some of those, and then uh, give you a chance to ask questions at the end. So thank you so I, much I for. Do you have a couple of questions? Yes, sir. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you select um, test kids to go into your advanced class? Could you say the last part? I'm sorry. So there, there are some kids that have a, a, a few classes. Right? Sure. So how do you go about selecting those kids and finding those kids? So if you're talking now for our top level classes. Yes. Uh, for most of our honors classes, uh, there is a, a combination of a test that they take about the content, um, as well as their past academic performance and their, um, you know, a, a recommendation, if you will, from teachers. When you get to the AP or even our CCP courses, uh, those have their own requirements. Um, we have uh, a lot more CCP, which is College Credit, college credit Plus um, courses that we offer in-house, uh, either through Edison uh, or through Indiana University East. Um, and they have their own requirements in terms of what it takes for a student to be eligible for those courses. But our goal is to give that opportunity. We added an, an AP Psych uh, course this past year, and our goal is to encourage students to take those upper level courses absolutely so so what does that program look like when you have students that maybe don't have a good home life or they have parents that are kind of pushing them that way but they're clearly capable so are you able to find those students and, 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 and pull them in and what does that process look look like so i think you asked maybe two different things i'll try to address both so um what i thought i heard you ask there was what does it look like for students who maybe have a challenging home situation, but are capable. Um, well, well my, my question is, how can Troy find students yep. that are capable of being in AP classes, that should be in the AP classes that are not? And what does that process look like? What does it require of that student to be accepted into that program? So for our students that have the aptitude, which I think that's the group that you're talking about, um, and, and I don't know, are you talking about students that haven't had a strong academic history or it, students it that be, have? Um, so let's say you have some, some students that maybe get straight C's. Sure. Okay. And they, they may be in the algebra two class and they ace their exams, right? Yep. So they're clearly capable of doing very high level work. Sure. However, there may be some things going on at home where they're taking care of their little sister, their little brother, their little mom, their dad is at work, and things aren't as easy as it should be. How are you able to find those students that could be your brightest stars in the city and bring them into that program where they can thrive? Got it. What does that look like? Great question. Um, we have two things. One is actually new this year. Um, 
and it's the time that, that Megan was talk of, talking about. Uh, it's called Trojan time. And so we've never really had a true advisory at the high school, uh, not anything of any substance. And so what, you know, what research will tell you is really to identify those types of students. It, it comes down to relationships. It comes down to knowing the student. And so we need to have an adult in their life that's able to know that student, know what they're capable of, and perhaps look at, okay, so I know you, but yet I see your grades. I think that's the student that you're talking about, and this doesn't match what I see here. Um, and so having more of an individual touch. Uh, the other thing that our counselors do every year is when they go through scheduling, they meet individually with every student for the scheduling process. Now, they don't have the time to sit and have that long dialogue with students to get to know them, to get to know them maybe as in depth as what uh, our goal is with, you know, Trojan time and with that advisory teacher. But that combination is really what we're looking at in terms of giving the advisory or the Trojan time teacher the opportunity to speak to the counselor and say, this student uh, is not performing academically where I believe that they should be, and then we can take a deeper dive to look at it. Do they, are they doing well on tests and not able to do homework? Is there something that's causing that? Um, and see what we can do to encourage that student and see if there are things that we can do to differentiate. Because um, again, what you're talking about is differentiated instruction. And those are conversations that we continue to have. In fact, this past week, I've had several meetings um, with groups at the high school talking about how are we going to continue to provide opportunities for our students who um, aren't typically identified as high performers. Um, we're offering an ACT prep um, that's coming up free. I don't know if anybody saw this. I just did a blast today to all of our junior parents. Um, we also put that out on social media, I believe. Mr. Fong did that today. Um, but one of the things that we're doing, I got a thumbs up. One of the things that we're doing with that, um, and there's a video by the gentleman who actually created this course and he's passionate about providing all students of all abilities that opportunity to show themselves that opportunity to shine and so uh, I think it's our responsibility I know it's our responsibility to put those opportunities in front of our students and if we're not putting those opportunities in front of our students we'll never have the chance to identify them uh, they'll they will have self-fulfilling prophecies of mediocre academic success so does that answer your question to give you a little bit of a better idea of what we're what we've been doing and what we're now trying to do to, to increase that it's challenging it's it's hard to find students that don't perform well but maybe have a high aptitude yeah. um, and that's why we're trying to provide that more personal touch to get there so, so there, there is a test for for these students to get into the AP classes along with someone saying that they're a good student they're, they're capable et cetera et cetera is that what i hear you say for our honors classes there, yes. there is there is a test for There's most test. of them yes okay and so can can most of the students take this test or is it something that they have to be o open to anybody it, it is open to anyone. yeah and that hasn't always been the case in recent okay. years that's a change that we've made um and that's something i feel passionate about uh very passionate about so if a student wants to sit and take uh, one of those exams, they should have that opportunity and not only have that opportunity, they should be encouraged right. to do that. So, uh, and we made that change um, when I was the principal at the junior high, I was there for seven years before I went to the high school. Uh, that's something that we did different in my time there. Um, not necessarily my idea, but just a change that we made and offering all of our students the opportunity to take, uh, there's an algebra readiness assessment that we would give uh, for students to see if they were ready to take algebra. Um, as eighth graders, and that wasn't always given to all students. And then we started giving that to all of our students for, for that same reason. So, so you have a test for math. Is there a test for English? So they, they all have a different uh, pathway okay. uh, to get into the honors programs. There's a, for physical science and biology, there are tests for English. There's a test uh, for geometry, um, honors geometry. We've kind of gone back and forth on that. And so um, we continue to tweak that to try to figure out what is the best pathway to identify our students who have a high aptitude. I, I know when I was growing up, our, our school, this is back in the 90s, we, the entire school took the test. Sure. And so it, it basically allowed everybody to have, you know, that really true access to, to those programs. And so yeah. it, it was really interesting. Right. I, and I think that's great. I mean, I, I, there's no way that we're going to identify them if we don't not only, and I think it goes beyond just having the opportunity to be there, but truly encouraging students yeah. to take those tests.
and that's daunting for eighth graders coming over to the high school to sit for an honors exam. Um, and that's a challenge that we have ahead of us still is to increase participation. Um, it's hard enough to walk across the parking lot. I mean, Kane, you can speak to that a little bit, but hard enough to walk across the parking lot from the junior high to the high school, but then to go over there as an eighth grader and sit down and take uh, a really rigorous test. I mean, that's, you know, there's, there's, there's some things that we need to work through on how can we make that more accessible? How can we make that um, a better opportunity for all of our students, not just our, our top, for, top performers? I don't have any other questions. Great. <laughs> any other questions for me? Like I said, um, Josh has a lot of great information to share. And I know he's happy to answer questions about um, our programming, but thank you again for inviting me, inviting us. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. Absolutely. Hi. Hi. Um, Josh Patterson. I'm the assistant principal at the junior high, but for the last three years, I ran the stadium program. Um, got a great introduction. So, <laughs> I'll open it up to questions. What do you guys, what would you like to know? Or do you want me to give you some stats or what do you, it's up to you guys. What do you want? I like how Dave acknowledged that things have changed. So maybe if you start with the changes mm -hmm. that might dissipate a lot of the question. Uh, I started here in 2017 at Troy. Um, I, I really, I've heard some things about what it was before. Yeah. Um, I don't know that for a fact. I mean, the people that um, work down there, for the most part, don't even work in the district anymore. So I, I don't want to, I can't speak to that. So, but even that with that, that's a yeah. change. So, yeah, I was brought in, uh, I was a teacher. I taught at Northridge for 13 years and then I was brought up here. I was going to coach football and I was brought up here and they needed some, uh, it was Eric Herman was the super then. And he said that, uh, he needed some change down there and they made my position and offered it to me. And I did. And, and uh, so for three years, I ran that and pretty proud of everything we did down there. So um, do you guys have questions? Uh, I, yeah. Just because I don't know the differences, but is it, there's also like an academy, right? The Troy Online Academy or That's something, something that's this year. Um, yeah, that's more for uh, since the COVID situation. Yeah, this, is, this was here before that. This would be for like an alternative school. Is what how I would. That's what. Th that's what it is. It's an alternative school. <laughs> and bigger cities. Sometimes, well, yeah, and most districts have it. Even the smaller ones have it, and to a degree. I mean, districts the size of Troy usually have something like this. So you're in person. If I'm an at-risk student, do I have my choice of doing the academy or doing your? You program? mean Troy Online Academy or the stadium? Those are two very different things. Okay. We. Maybe I, I, I'm just trying to figure who chooses whether you go with, who gets to go to the academy? The academy? Yeah. The, um, the parents chose that. Right? Okay. So the, the, chair, the parent chooses that choice. If you're talking about Troy Online Academy, yeah. that answer is yes, because that is this year because of COVID. Yeah. So we gave our all of our students the option to choose online coursework exclusively because of health concerns or whatever okay. due to COVID. So what's Jeff Schultz doing? Isn't he doing an online thing? And John, is is not, nothing is not the appropriate answer. How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> on a good day or on a... I thought he was doing an online... Deal. Well, so I, 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 think, I think I'll answer your question and make, it, make a little bit more sense. Uh, so I'll come back. I'll join with your yeah. action here. Um, so the Troy Online Academy is something that we're offering for all students in grades K-12. Uh, that started this year because of the pandemic. At the high school, we're managing that in-house um, and teachers are teaching, uh, that we'll have teachers that will have face-to-face -face students uh, some periods and then online students other periods. Um, we have many families that chose that because of the pandemic. Um, moving forward, I don't anticipate uh, as many families desiring that type of learning environment for their students. So that's a totally separate piece um, as opposed to the TOPS and CBI programs that we're running out of the classroom that's at the stadium. Um, so I think your question was, so who gets to choose if they go into the Troy Online Academy? That was a sole parent decision. Um, academically speaking, that's been challenging. 
Um, and we have some students uh, who have struggled academically. We've offered as much assistance as we can from afar and, and virtually. Um, but given the fact that we're in a pandemic, that's really been a, a challenge for us, if I'm, you know, if I'm being honest. Um, I anticipate many of those families will be returning to us when we're no longer in the middle of a pandemic because they recognize, and we hear that from them, that you know, face-to-face -face learning is really what their students need, but because of health concerns in the home or some other reason, they weren't able to send them face-to-face. -face. Um, now with the programs that uh, Mr. Patterson oversaw for the previous three years, that's, um, those are those students that are at risk. Um, and one of the things that we've worked really hard on is developing a watch list, if you will, of students when you're talking about the academic side of who might be identified for that program. Um, those then are meetings that we have with parents and students to talk about educational options. Um, and again, those are the students who have typically not had a lot of academic success. And so that's when we start those conversations of, okay, what options do we have in the building, which we have plenty of credit recovery options. Um, and then at a certain point, okay, when is this learning environment no longer successful for you and you really need something that's much smaller with much more one-on-one uh, -on -one support, which is what we're able to offer uh, at the stadium. Those are decisions that typically we initiate or conversations that we initiate with the families. Um, the other side of that would be students with anxiety, with health concerns. Many of those are conversations that the family initiates with us. Uh, because we have 1,200 students in the high school, um, and there are a number of students, um, and, and Josh can speak to this, and just in his three years, the number of students who uh, received programming through either TOPS or CBI that wanted nothing to do uh, with any opportunity uh, to go to the high school, because I think there's maybe some misconception that we're keeping students away from these opportunities that are in the building, which is not at all what we're doing. In fact, um, during the time that he and I worked together when he oversaw the program, uh, we had a couple of students who we worked through and came together with a plan for them to return to the high school. And that was an academic success plan because they really wanted that opportunity. And so those are opportunities that are always there for our students. Um, and I'm stealing all the thunder here, but <laughs> we currently have a student in our band program who goes up to the high school to take band, but takes his academics uh, at in, in the classroom at the stadium because that's a better learning environment for that student. Um, we've had students in track and football on the basketball team. Um, we've had students participate in choir. choir. Um, so in terms of the opportunities, the announcements are read there. We, we, it's, it's our food that we provide students. So access to all of the same things. They get to go to our dances or you know, anything that we offer, graduation, all of those pieces that, that this is all. And, and, I don't know what it was like before. I just know what it should be like. And that's where I, I feel like Josh really did a tremendous job the year before I went to the high school in taking leaps and bounds in that direction. We continued to head in a very positive direction. So hopefully that it was a long winded answer to your question, but hopefully that helps clarify the difference between the two. Sorry for stealing all your You're fine. <laughs> and just to be clear, I sometimes wonder what Jeff Schultz is doing. <laughs> 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 now, are these young people referenced to you from teachers, parents? Um, no, we track them. We track them usually. We have, well, we have what we call it edge list. Dave kind of talked about it before. And we basically track them. Like if after the first quarter, say a kid is a freshman and he has all X, he's, autom he's going to be put on that list because he's in danger of not gaining credits to graduate. So he'll be put on the watch list. That doesn't necessarily mean that he'll ever make it to the stadium, but like, hey, this kid got five Fs in the first quarter of his freshman year. He is, he's in danger of falling behind. Okay. So we would put him on there and we track him until it gets to the point where we have to do something. And then that's usually when we call, we call the parents and it's a decision. The parents always have the final say. We've had parents say, no, they're not going down there. And I think a lot of it was of whatever happened before they, they have a stigma of it, which it wasn't, but that would only happen like it once. Um, but Usually we just kind of Mr. Patterson change your mind immediately. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm nothing but personality. So um, they, you know, we just kind of talk through and we show them what's going on and we have the different programs and we 
there. Now, is it a work program, school program, or what exactly? So we have two is different it? programs. Okay. CBI is what, like when I was in school, it's called OWE. Right. So, and that's like, I guess, the first shift. So, do you want to just kind of take you through what a day Please, looks like? Please, can sure. you? Yeah, yeah sure. Yes, All right. So, it's school starts at seven forty. And our kids usually come in, if they get on the bus, they kind of come down the hill, they're going the opposite way of everyone else, or they, if they drive, they park at the stadium, or if they walk, they come in at 740, um, they eat breakfast there, you know, around uh, 750, um, our CBI teacher, Mr. Dixon, will either play the announcements or read the announcements, go over any kind of business from the day, and that's usually when, or if he has like a CBI lesson or something like that, because it, it's basically um job skills job interviews how to do this how to keep a job they will talk about that and then they actually do their classes on a program called odyssey learning so they do that um, there's usually a break in there if it's nice like not today they wouldn't but usually they would go walk around the track for a while you know just to get up because you can't sit there and stare at a screen the whole time um, some students would go up to choir band bands later in the day so that would be later but choir i think is third period i don't know if it still is a lot of students will go do that. Well, not a lot, but a few. Um, and then they would leave around 1140. And we did have transportation. I don't know if we have that. We had a need for a while for transportation. So we had a bus route for that. I think that need is kind of gone. And they're going to work theoretically, right? Yeah, well, yeah, well, they actually are. And then Mr. Dixon in the afternoon, he'll go. It's just like OWE. He would go and he works with their employers and stuff. Like if kids have any problems at his job, He's the kind of the, the go between. Do we have okay. a 100% employment rate or? Uh, no, pretty close. I mean, um, we'll, we'll have kids that, you know, for whatever reason, a job doesn't work out. You know, some of them, it's their first job. They're not used to, I have to be here at this time and I'm staying until, you know. But then Mr. Dixon, he has a lot of connections in town with employers. He usually finds them another one pretty quick. And then, I mean, they, I think it's around a month we give them to maybe get another job and if they don't then you know hey you can't be in the program because part of the program part of your day is the work aspect so do they switch to tops then yes they can not? or they could go back up to the high school so then there there could be from the outside looking in an assumption that they're they're not being held to work but they've actually probably switched to tops and like yeah i mean yeah okay. you could okay. yeah we've had kids switch to tops okay yeah and then, so at 1140, they usually leave. Um, it gives, uh, I think that's usually when Mr. Dixon and then Mr. Miller comes down. That's usually when they have their lunch. And then, is, is Sporty still there? And are they eating still separate from the, the kids up there? Probably because of their schedules, I would assume, right? Yeah. Breakfast and lunch? Well, the morning doesn't get lunch. They leave before lunch is served. Okay. So, um, they would leave, they get breakfast, and yeah, they usually eat down there. Okay. We make coffee, a lot of kids will drink coffee. They just kind of talk. <laughs> and then like, we do the announcements, if Mr. Dixon has a lesson or something, we do that. If not, they start taking their classes. How so they, does the credits, do they get credit for the amount of time that they are there or the amount of time that they are at work towards their graduation? They get work for credits, yes. Or, okay. so they get credit for work. And then they're actually taking classes or making up classes. Some of them are credit deficient. So they'll be either, not all, but if you're credit deficient, you're working on the classes that maybe you failed up top, mm -hmm. like your freshman year, mm -hmm. or you're taking your junior classes, your CBI classes, and it's, it's through Odyssey Learn as well. Now, can these credits carry over to like a two-year college or whatever? They get a diploma. They get a diploma. Yeah. Um, OWE is more for kids who are going to go into the workforce right after. Okay. Um, we have kids that go to like Edison and two-year schools. What about, have they been tested for like JVS if maybe they're, you know. Really CBI, it, it is a Upper Valley program. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, the Upper Valley, it's usually, CBI starts in the 11th grade. So it's for the kids who didn't go to Upper Valley. Right. Or some just don't want to do it. They don't. There's no programs there, or that they want to take, or for whatever reason, they just want to take CBI and come we in. We work with a few students. Um, I mean, even in my three years at the high school, who um, they've had a family situation. 
and they yeah. needed to take on a, a larger General. employment responsibility. Yeah. And so this program actually serves them well because they can still take classes with a person in the morning and receive credits to get a high school diploma while they've taken on that additional responsibility. Um, and as Mr. Patterson said, for most of the others, it's students who chose not to go to yes. the career center. Some didn't have credits, um, but many of them made that choice. They would rather go work and make money than to go to the career center. And so, you know, we, we navigate those different pathways with them uh, on what works best and what would be best for their, their current situation. Can you tell me why it was placed, the kids called it the dungeon. I talked to a couple of kids that went there and they call it the dungeon. Can you tell uh, me why it was actually placed there in the first place, down um, underneath? I've never yeah. heard it called the dungeon. Yeah. Uh, the biggest yeah. thing is room. Um, I tell you, there's a lot of kids, especially when we start in August, that wouldn't mind being down there because it's air conditioning, <laughs> there's a kitchen. I mean, now, yeah. Okay, um, but why was it initially placed underneath there? Wait, underneath the stadium? Yeah room we don't have any more room at the high school well, that was a room that we could use I, I think maybe and i don't know if it was in a different location prior to its current location but it, it's really not under the stadium it's actually yeah. in a uh, so there's a building that's separate from the football the building are. Yeah. yeah yeah um and so that's that's a classroom space that's the that's actually um, the room that we use to honor retirees um, at the end of the year when we have uh, yeah. it's a, called the victory room a ceremony so <laughs> that you know the, the space the, why it's down there currently is because we have space issues at the high school why it was initially placed which is what your question was I, I'm not sure what the initial that was beyond was. yeah that was okay. before me okay. if, you're, if you're not familiar with that space I, I, would, I would take Mr. Dillon Dill up on his offer to come visit because it okay. truly is one of the nicest mm -hmm. instructional spaces we have in the district it has air conditioning it has a kitchenette and as Mr. Dildo just said, it is such a nice space that I would prefer to move all of our board meetings down there, but we have a conflict with the programming down there. So when we do honor our retirees, that's where we do it. We wouldn't take them to a dungeon to I, honor our retirees. In your surveys, um, did anything come up about feeling isolated or? No, no, and I think that just from my experiences too, when we talk, you know, we talk least restrictive environment all the time in, in all educational planning, but especially, you know, there's a whole separate place for it on IEPs and, and not that this is the same student, but I think that we have, I think remembering and being sensitive to the fact that everybody feels like they can, their optimal environment for learning all looks different, which is why we want to offer a lot of different, like my kids loved hybrid because they loved small groups. You know, they loved having more teacher one-on-one. -on -one. I've got, both my kids are in Troy. They liked having that, that one-on-one, -on -one, more one-on-one -on -one attention. So I think that remembering that luckily we have a whole variety of, of options in order for students to feel like they can perform optimally with who they are as people yeah. and who they are as learners. And, and I think that's exceptional when kids realize who they are as learners and what serves them best. So before this program, when you had these sort of, I, I guess, no W, I was in, I, that's what they call it. I, o -W, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. that program, but the TOPS program, without this outreach, would these students just not graduate? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we're, so this is really designed this is to, to get allow kids somebody to get that high school graduation. Absolutely. That they I think have. I get the feeling that this must, this is before me, that this was like a punishment before, place. Mm -hmm. Before you, before you, before you. Actually. This is not a punishment place. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, most of, I would say 30% of the kids down there are down there for anxiety. Just like we, we had a student that moved from a small community and then all of a sudden you're at Troy High School and there's 1,200 kids walking mm -hmm. around and the town they lived in didn't have 1,200 kids or 1,200 people. It's more for that. Um, well, and you want to speak to the, to the demographics? I mean, I know one of the questions was about the yeah, the demographics. It's, I mean, almost if you, almost identical. Yeah, well, I ran the numbers. Uh, when I saw the question, I wanted to know for myself, so I actually yeah. pulled all of our students that are in that programming, and it, it's within three and a half percent of. So our the high school is um, about twenty percent minority students. Uh, our students receiving programming 
in the stadium classroom, it's 23 and some change percent. So it's almost a mirror image of our student body uh, at the high school. And, and when you're talking about the number of students, that's a difference of three or four students max, two, three, probably students. Like it's at a typical time, you'll have 43 students. That's both combined. Um, and it fluctuates. Like someone may graduate early, which we do have a lot of that. So then they leave and then sometimes someone comes down, sometimes they don't. Usually around the end of the semesters, end of the year, it's pretty much it's pretty much cut in half. There's usually 20 to 25 in there. I would say maybe five plus years ago, if you looked at the data, it would probably be a higher behavioral sure. as opposed to that. And so if you were stuck in that environment or if you yeah. wanted to go get breakfast and someone said, what are you doing? Your breakfast is down. You might have felt alienated yeah. Yeah. because you just wanted to partake. And that's some of the things that I kind of did. Like they didn't have breakfast. I yeah. got, that was one of the first things that I, I got. Um, the busing in the middle of the day, I worked with Mr. Piper to get that. That was something that, you know, if it's one kid that needs it, all right. But we had about seven that needed it. So, and, and they were kind of dis, were, in your opinion, did you feel that kids were not? acclimated enough meaning band and sports and going to dances and things like when you first got there like maybe you no. had to say hey this is still your school too no they they went to prom they went to the homecoming okay. um we've always had kids that participated in athletics um when i first got there there was two girls that would go up every day for choir for a period there was kids that participated in the band um later like they would actually come back to school because it was after school when band was so or seventh period and then after school. Do you get a lot of behavioral incidences where no. you have to protect uh, my, kids with anxiety? No, if it, I would take Mr. Dillbone up. If you walk into that, 90% of the kids aren't gonna notice you're in there because we let them listen to music, which they're not allowed to do up there. And they just sit there and they work. And most of them are trying, they, they have a goal. They're trying to graduate or they're trying, they're kind of past all that. And sometimes like I've had kids take this isn't all the kids, but they've said, take me out of there, took all the pressure off. I don't have to entertain or be a certain way. I can just come down here and do what I'm doing and get done. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll add in, in fact, we protect that classroom uh, yeah. now, maybe more so than ever for that reason, uh, because we don't want to have a situation because of the number of students that are down there with a purpose or yeah. um, are down there because of anxiety, we, we the last thing we would want is to make that a volatile situation. Yeah. So there, yeah, we've a lot done of our conversations that we had the previous two years when we were talking about okay, is this the right placement? If it was a student who had some behavioral struggles, we would consider that because that may not be the right placement. Um, that environment has really uh, become such a positive space. And our students look forward to that. It's a, it's a place of safety. It's a place of security. It's a place of consistency. It's a place where they're supported. Yeah. Um, and we don't want to jeopardize that. that it means a lot to us, um, similar to what we saw in the survey. And those students were surveyed as well. Again, we need to increase participation, and we're, we're going to work on that. But they have that same opportunity. So what's your success, I guess, since you've been there over the like, three and a half years, you said, or four years? What's the success rate on obtaining a diploma over those years compared to the history prior? Um, well, I'll get, I got the data from last year. Last year, we had 43 kids in our program that were eligible to graduate. Um, let me see. I wrote it while I typed it. There was 40 kids eligible to graduate. We graduated 34 of them. Three of them did not. Three of them withdrew and went to another school. So I missed on three kids. And out of those 30, historically, how many of them do you think would have graduated based upon your experience? Like, it would have been rough because I'll get kids that are um, their junior year and they have two and a half credits and you need 21. That's, you know, and we, and the other thing we run down there is the summer school program. And they can work on home. They can work right. at home. Yeah, we actually want them to do that, especially the CBI kids. Like, if you're not working this afternoon, just, just give me a half hour. Give me 45 because it all it all builds up. Well, Todd, to answer yeah. your question, <laughs> direct, without that program, 
I would go as far as to say that almost all of those students wouldn't graduate. Um, the, the ones that were credit deficient, again, some of those right. 34, if you take 30% of those students, they may not have been credit deficient, but the other 70% that were credit deficient, uh, I would almost guarantee that they would not graduate without that pathway. Because that, that's why they were identified, because they had fallen behind and yeah. despite our best efforts, we weren't able to get them back up to stand. And, and out of that group last year, that made up 10% of our graduating class. So, no, I think that's a good story to tell because I, I think there is, you know, perhaps there was at least on our meeting some preconceived notions. I've heard of the stigmas, I have. And, and, and as I went and talked to more people, you, you know, either through the juvenile court or through you guys or through even Jeff Schultz, who I had a long talk with about this, <laughs> uh, it, 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 you know, I do think that there are some misperceptions and and I what agree. it's used for and you know that it's not disciplinary because i think a lot of us at least initially thought it was a disciplinary mm -hmm. issue that people were going down there and, and um, i can't speak to that but since i've been there that's not how it's been used um whether it was and if you're graduating i mean there's 30 kids that are at least gonna yeah 34 or whatever chance. you just showed your number that are gonna walk out of here with you know and most of them up. already have a job like we we have a lot of kids like and then we have another pro program that is kind of predates Troy Online Academy. We call it the Flex program. And that was for kids who really had trouble. Like they had serious things going on at home. Some of them were the main breadwinner. Um, you know, I'll just give you an example without a name, but like we had a kid who worked third shift at Clopay and he was having trouble getting in there. And that's kind of where the Flex program came about, Flex for Flexible. Yeah. And I said, hey, can you work? Can you work in the evening and, and, and give me some time? And he did that. And, Oh, you want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Um, one of my, one of the, um, this student, um, she actually works here in Troy. Um, she's, one, she's one of the ones that I'm probably most proud of. She came to us, I think she had a half a credit or one, and she was going into her junior year. Mm -hmm. So I asked her kind of to write something of what it meant to her, and I'll read it for you. Um, she wrote, to who it may concern, the stadium gave me a different outlook on my schooling. I was ready to drop out because I didn't want to put myself around a bunch of people. The stadium offered a safe place for me to go and study. It gave me a safe place to get my stuff done. The teachers kept me going even when I didn't want to. It gave me an opportunity to be able to work and get my schooling done. If it weren't for this program, I would be a dropout and I wouldn't be where I am today. Now a pharmacy technician certified to do immunizations. And most importantly, I have my diploma. Not to mention, I have been Two years behind, and because of this program, I got two years ahead and was able to graduate on time. If, if it weren't for this program, I know a lot of kids who would have ended up being dropouts. The teachers in this program give ample opportunities to be able to succeed in a work environment and get schooling done efficiently. This program not only helps with getting, getting put into a work environment, but also for kids who struggle with anxiety or get bullied. The stadium is a smaller classroom, less students. It's genuinely a wonderful program, and I think there are a lot of benefits out of it. The high school or junior high are not always meant for everyone, but graduating is meant for everyone. The stadium gave me that opportunity, and I will be forever grateful for it, and the teachers who pushed me to graduate and work. And then she signed it, and a graduate student, a graduated student from the stadium. What year did you graduate? Um, last year. Last year. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for your time. I mean, I don't know how you beat that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Great. She okay. said it better than I ever could. Yeah. So. yeah. Well, and, and, and that's what we talked about is that there are some students here in town. And she's one of them who, I mean, that's a success story. She, yeah. you heard it from her. Yeah. Uh, without this programming, she would not be in the position that she's in. And she's not just employed. She's in a she's in a career. Yeah. Again, back when we talked about earlier, the college and career ready. And she she came out of that program career ready. And she's proud of the career that she has. And we're proud of her. And then and then there's a there's a there's a bunch of kids like this that I've just I see around town when I'm in Troy, you know. And those are the kids, I mean your your advanced placement kids, they they're gonna go to college, they might stay in Columbus or wherever they go to school, you know, Toledo, wherever. 
these are the kids that are going to live and grow up here in Troy. So I take pride in that. that these are the kids that are going to stay here and be our neighbors. Um, I spoke to kids who are in the program a couple, like many years ago, and okay. some who are in it now. Yeah. Um, I can feel your love and your passion mm -hmm. radiating. Well, um, I don't get that often, but I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> Thank I, you. Maybe it's a teacher connection, yeah. but um, I, I can tell that you really care for it. And I can tell you that I spoke to kids that are currently in it, and they had really great things to say. Uh, now, students who in the past, like mm -hmm. many years past, yeah. prior to you had not said great things. Mm -hmm. So it warms me to know all of the great things that you are doing and I commend Thank you. Thank you, I that. appreciate it. Um, now with the success rate, do you plan to start measuring post high school just to see what's working, what's not working and just to continue to build the program? I'm not in the program anymore. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm at the, the middle school. Okay. So, um, <laughs> and that's fine, that's fine. I'll, no, that's okay. Yeah. I would go back. To, uh, the reason I wanted to be here tonight is because I don't want this program to look that way. Yeah. So. I have a daughter mm. who is damaged from the past. Mm. Can we exchange numbers? I would love to have her come down and see the changes. Sure. Just to help her heal from, she was disciplinary to be over there. Again, not mm. under anybody's watch in this room. And I'm super proud of like all the changes and I think it will help her heal mm -hmm. from what she's been through from the past. So if you're open, so you, you, you give me a call anytime. Okay, yeah. I will. Have I will. it set up. And, and if need be, I mean, coordinate a, a visit for as many of you that would like to see you. Again, I think the space itself, there were some questions about that. Um, I, I'd like to go down and spend some time there during the day, uh, yeah. more, than, <laughs> more than normal. So I'm happy to take you down and uh, okay. feel Thank free you. to bring her as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. I didn't even get through the day, but if you guys want to hear more, I got, you know, more, but if you have any other questions, I'll, I'm happy to answer them. No, I don't. What is the ratio of teachers? And if a child is having trouble, uh, can you call someone else to help them? With well, there's, it is? there's always a certified teacher down there. Okay. One. Uh, at least one, usually two. And there's also an aide that comes kind of, a, she's in the middle of both shifts. Okay. Um, it's a smaller ratio than the regular classroom. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's so probably 12, 20, 13, maybe? 20 to 30 students per teacher. Uh, if we're packed at the beginning yeah, of a I semester, see, yeah, there would the be. The average is uh, around 20. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so that's okay. okay. So, yeah. And then if kids need help, we've had teachers. Math mm -hmm. is always uh, yeah. a bugaboo. Mm -hmm. So they we'll get a math teacher, you know, to either they go up and meet with them, or I've had teachers come down, like on their plan period. We had teachers come. Meet them after school. I mean, so. And one of the certified teachers is also an intervention specialist. Yes. Which works really well because our students who are identified with special needs, uh, that teacher can then speak specifically to the educational needs that they have. And so it's, it's really a, a very nice balance. Uh, that, student, that teacher works with all students, mm -hmm. um, but then has a special focus for students who have any identified special needs. And the two teachers that we have down there really have the perfect mindset to be down there. Um, a lot of the kids don't need prodded anymore. They don't need confronted. They might need boundaries, but they don't need anything further and they have a perfect temperament for it. Who are the teachers now? Can I say it? I didn't know. Sure. Oh, Tim Miller and Shane Dixon. Okay. They do a great job. Just have one. Yes. Yeah. So we, we've heard that a lot of the kids have maybe an anxiety issue, and then there's some kids that have some other issues. So are, are there any things that you all are doing to try to find what the root causes of those issues are so that you can kind of fix them? Sure. Going forward? Um, we've had kids, you know, and, and to tell you the truth, we probably get it more than they would up the school. They'll, they'll come up to, they used to come up to me, or they come up to Mr. Miller or Mr. Dixon and say, hey, I need to talk someone. And they would either go up to go to their counselor or the school psychologist. All we do, if it was something we thought needed to be good, one of us would go with them. Or if I was up there, I would come down and get them. But if they just, you know, sometimes it's a normal thing. Like, hey, about once a week, I need to go up and talk to, you know, my counselor. And we just call up and say, you know, so-and-so is on their way. So they buzz them in and they go in. But yeah, that's, that's always available. I think my question was more of, um, I think a lot of the kids 
maybe going through something that got them on that track to be there, right? Definitely, yeah. So, so like they're, they're like an intake service that they go through so that you can look at what's going on, what's causing these issues, why are they here, and how, how can we help them along the way with that issue while we're getting them out the door to graduate. Does that make sense? Uh, do you mean like the edge list, how they get down there, how they get referred to us? I think that's part of the answer, Josh. I think probably during the, um, the process to get students into that track, our counselors are part of that process. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. okay. It, it, you know, our, our school counselors have a wonderful skill set, but they're not always licensed mental health counselors. So yeah. right. if they identify that need, they would, they would connect a student with those outside services. And also, beyond that time when they're down there in the program, it's that it's the relationship they have with the staff. It's the, it's the teacher relationship because the ratio is smaller and it's a small group of students. They really create a community down there. For yes, sure. very much. And teachers get to know those kids very well. Yep. So it wouldn't always be a kid just saying, I need the help. It's also the teacher identifying that something's up today. And do you have access to like mental health services? Oh, sure. I know like it's depleting without yeah. substance abuse around here now. So we do. Okay. Yeah. And, and part of the edge sheet, sorry, part of the edge sheet, th it's more than just credit deficient. I mean, we have like, you know, standardized tests, like which ones they're missing, they need. And there's also the social emotional issues and I mean, behaviors on there, but that's so not one of the things. I mean, usually. So like if, if a child has dyslexia or learning, is that on the parent to be self-directed to find that testing or do they work with? Oh no, we would work with that. And, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's all. It, it, really, the only thing that's different is they don't change classes and they're down in a more comfortable space. That's about it. And they, they're shorter day, shorter day. So, well, and, and so piggyback they're not sweating in all this. Yeah. Your question about <laughs> um, finding the root cause. Yeah. One of the things that I was quickly impressed with by both Josh and teachers down there, it's um, any time a student's name came up that was involved in that programming, uh, there was no shortage of people who could tell me where the student lived, what was going on at home, where they were, yeah. what their parent situation was. I, I mean, the gamut of all of the personal things that the only way to gather that information is by building a relationship. Um, and the students were very open. Uh, as Josh said, and, and he was probably a little too humble on that, so I'll, I'll pat him on the back. The students truly took an interest in the staff and the staff took an interest in the students and, and there were true relationships where students would share. Um, many times they didn't come up to receive support from our school counselors because the staff um, really served as a closer person to them than, than a school counselor who they didn't see as often. Mm -hmm. There is there was a lot of good relationships down there. It's impossible to run a program like that without it. If you can't make relationships, mm -hmm. that's not the place for you. Mm -hmm. And so without getting into that, there, there are a lot of good relationships that were made. And I, like when I was a teacher, I, was teaching, I didn't know what I knew about them that I did like when I had a whole yeah. class. There's, it's not even comparable. So, Josh, you want to share some of the site visits that we made and then the other schools that you reached out to? I know that was part of the question of what other schools are offering. I think yeah, most great. schools do this. The, the best one, we went to two of the best, I think, in the state. The first one's Westerville, who's been doing this for a while, I think over 15 years. And uh, the guy that runs that, he's, he is the uh, the Bill Belichick of this, I guess. He is, <laughs> he's the man, he, and they, he has his own building. I mean, it is, that is what you aspire to be. Marysville also had a very, very good one. Uh, Marysville, we were a little closer to it. It had its own building go too. They had a little more staff. Uh, Marysville's roughly our size. Yeah. Um, but we, we went to those two, those are the two best. So that's, the, that's where our, our dream would be to um, grow this program. You yeah. know, right now we have a single classroom in, in an ideal world, uh, we would be able to expand this because yeah. as we talked about, that's a part of the reason that we have to have a watch list because we need to be cautious with space and numbers yeah. and all of those pieces. So this is truly a program that's exceptional that we're offering. Um, and not a dumping ground that, you know, maybe there was some, some concerns that, that what, that's what it currently is. And it's not that at all. In the new building plans, was there a bigger space? There would be, definitely, yes. But not its own building? Potentially its own building. Okay. 
Named after Mr. Patterson, of course. Yeah. <laughs> no. I've already, I have a name, but I, I won't share yeah. it. So. You guys are doing great work. And one of the things, because we're going to get to some other things on the agenda, that we're going to do is talking about outreaches to HRC. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully we can partner with you. I don't know if you've had that, and we haven't adopted any of this stuff, but we're going to have some brochures and some posters and some things that we would like to implement so that people who would experience issues that they uh, feel are directly related. And so hopefully, you know, we appreciate, you know, having you guys come here and share your thoughts and hopefully you can help us get the message out as well that, you, you know, we want to be inclusive and, and we want to, to be diverse. And if you feel that there are issues, I, I think we're going to have some materials we're going to pass out in a little bit that okay. perhaps you guys would be willing to look at and, and help us uh, disseminate. Yeah, no problem. We appreciate the chance to talk to you. No other questions? Thank you. We'd like to talk to you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a question. Yeah. No, no, not you. You oh. done a great job, though. <laughs> you did good. You can sit now. <laughs> well, I'm good. I mean, I yes, um, I am very interested in um, how many Black teachers there are. In Troy, I think there are five, okay. counting the principal. Sure. And um, my kids, when I went to Troy, yep. um, my kids went to Troy. Yep. Two of my grandchildren are now going to Troy. Okay. Um, I would very much like for your teachers to look a little <coughs> bit more like uh, minority, or it be Hispanic, Chinese, Black. I agree. Um, the kids see, especially in Troy, they don't see a lot of black teachers or they did when I was in school. Yeah. I think we had three, yeah. uh, <laughs> which was a lot sure. then. Cause that was back in the, <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, back in Odie Odie. Um, <laughs> but I, I am really into making Troy look more like a community, a real community, like it is. I agree. Um, in order to to be at the table, we have to have people in every different area of Troy, and that's not happening, or has not happened. Like our group here started after something happened, and if we don't do something about that, something else is going to happen. And we'll be back right back here again. We had a riot when I was in school in the 70s, well, late 60s. And we had a group like this. It was defunct. Now we're back again. Now I won't be here in the next 50 years, but I don't want my grandchildren to go through this again. So I would love for you, if you need help in finding places, we have our historical black colleges. We can get your names, addresses, and phone numbers if you need them. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, I probably, yeah, I know Mr. Piper uh, can probably speak a little bit more about hiring practices, but yeah. I know we're doing some things um, and probably more even so currently at the central office. So okay. I think I'll defer to okay. him to help answer I know Mr. Barhorst can share some information previously. Um, <clears throat> So just recently, uh, within the past couple of weeks, the Ohio Department of Education um, shares some information that there are grant opportunities uh, for schools to pursue different um, pathways to hire more minorities. So Mr. Barhorst is actively pursuing that grant right now. Okay. Uh, he's working with other human resource directors to talk about what options there may be, like those you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But we are pursuing some funding to help expand those opportunities. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much for saying that. Yeah. I think that's important. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Um, has the school programs looked into um, like the 1619 project? I mean, I think it's very controversial, and there's things that I see in there that I don't really care for. But I think it's more of like the idea of looking at the at history from a different perspective. And I think it brings a lot of light and discussion to things, especially for students. I know that discussing with 
um, minority students that I went to school with um, and students now talk about how things are kind of whitewashed and they mm -hmm. feel like things aren't talked about till like Black History Month. Um, and also kind of, they feel as soon as they bring up slavery or anything mm -hmm. of that sort, they feel very pinpointed and stared at and stuff like that. But I think looking at history in a different, different perspective, like not necessarily using the 16, 1619 project, but something of that idea, that basis. Well, I am, I am myself a recovering high school history teacher. <laughs> recovery. <laughs> it's, near, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, no, I agree with you. Um, I think that Ohio does a pretty good job um, making sure our curriculum, Ohio, the Ohio Department of Education and the Ohio Board of Education establish statewide curriculum. And then we can follow that statewide curriculum. And having been participant in that process before, I can tell you that when, those, when the curriculum is reviewed, uh, there is an emphasis on making sure that all walks of life, all creeds, all colors, or have a voice in that process to make sure that they're represented. So um, things have come a long, long way from the history books that I first taught from to where we are today, and that is only getting better. I know that currently the State Board and Ohio Department of Education are currently reviewing curriculum now um, with the special emphasis on what you're talking about. So that work is being done. I, I trust the experts who are doing <laughs> that work. I know some of them very well in the State Board, um, and they will do a good job making sure that So may I ask, um, what's being done in, in Troy High School for Black History Month? Nothing. I'm glad you asked. I uh, was going to bring it up, but I, I thought I'd wait to see if there was a, a question. Um, so I met with a group of students, um, and actually tomorrow, uh, so they've been working on this project. Um, so I had a group of our student leaders um, of different ethnicities that uh, came to me and said, could we do something for Black History Month? And, so we met um, with as many snow days as we've had. I honestly don't remember which day it was, but recently. Um, and, and they, so they approached me, and I said, well, let's sit down and talk. I love the idea. Let's just make sure that you know we're thinking the same things. Um, so sat down with them. I said, well, what are your ideas? Well, we would like to uh, display our um, all of our African American uh, leaders in different content areas. Uh, so they created a list of 45 names: uh, scientists, mathematicians, you. poets, um, mm -hmm. athletes, mm -hmm. uh, you name it. And so, in the high school, if you're familiar with it or if you're not, um, most of our classes are clustered by content areas. So we have a hallway that's called the math hall. So in the math hall, uh, we're going to uh, they, they have posters that they created that will identify and celebrate uh, African-American leaders in mathematics. Um, do the same thing near our science classrooms, our English classrooms. Um, so one of the things that I just encouraged them on was making sure that it was identifiable so that people knew what we were doing and, and why we were doing it. Um, that was really about the only thing I added to their discussion. And then I, I said, and that's why we just need to get out of your way. Uh, because that they, they have so many great ideas, and, and we have tremendous leaders in the high school. So I could be more proud of them and the fact that that's a project that they are excited to move forward with. Like I said, the snow days have slowed us down a little bit um, in getting that completed. Okay. Um, so in, in the history classes, and I, I guess, Mr. Parker, since you taught history, um, what, what's being taught in the history classes about Black History Month, um, about African Americans? I'm just curious. One of, the, one of the reasons I liked teaching history so much is because you find yourself um, in times like you know, having Washington or, or the Black History Month, that these things happen to give you opportunities to talk specifically about those topics. So I have no doubt that um, our teachers in the high school are, are heavily engaged in talking about Black History Month. Um, we, we talk about Black achievements and Black um, contributions to the country throughout the course, but this is specifically a month where that becomes a real um, intense focus. And that's what's really cool about it in high school, is that kids come with questions. <clears throat> kids want to know. Um, so having that chance to have that dialogue with students is really engaging what I miss about it. Do you want to talk about student government and how phenomenal we have been? Because I think that's really cool. Tremendous, yeah. And so um, I've already uh, I already shared this idea with Mr. Paul, and once this goes up, um, 
we've had a lot of success recently in receiving uh, support from the local media, um, and, uh, and this is something that we're going to try to get some additional support on because I'm, I'm just so proud of our students. Um, from that to the Key Club offering uh, free tutoring to students of, of all levels, um, especially during this pandemic, um, that was something, if you didn't see that, that, that ran on at least one of the local news stations. Um, so we're just the high school right now, um, our students are doing a lot of great things. And what I'm trying to do as their principal is, is support them and say yes as often as I can, uh, because they're, they're really, uh, we have leaders that are going to lead this community um, and, and beyond. And so I mean that when I say part of my job is to get out of their way. Um, it's easy as an adult to find yourself in that no pattern. I, I'm, I'm the hold up guy, I'm, I'm the principal. Um, but so many times I remind them that come to me with ideas because I want to say yes. I, I might give them some suggestions that, you know, I have some wisdom. I, I'm a little further down the path than, than they are. I think I have some wisdom. <laughs> Don't, nobody, no comments, please. Um, but I am, I'm just so proud of them. I often wondered if um, the school had the ability to look at, you know, maybe Rachel's challenge, yeah. but honor the fact that they arose to a challenge and to hold that challenge since it's, right sure. here in their community, if yeah. that's possible. What excites me is I think this generation of students is mm -hmm. particularly socially conscious. Yes, mm -hmm. um, that's it. My son is a sophomore, junior now at Ohio State. His friends and the students at the high school, they're very impressive. Mm -hmm. Not just in what they're achieving academically, mm -hmm. but that whole mindset. I'm, mm -hmm. We're in good hands. Oh, yeah. yeah, I agree. Watching Madison I take agree. that survey yeah. was, oh, I was just like, I had to pick my mouth up. She was, <laughs> I was very impressed. When I reminded, it's a great point, Mr. Piper. I reminded our students when I met with them um, of some conversations we've had recently, of, and I think that's that's oftentimes a flaw that we have as adults is that we don't give them enough credit mm -hmm. for how aware they are mm -hmm. uh, of what's not only going on locally but you know nationally and globally. And, and our mm -hmm. students are very aware, and so they need these opportunities through surveys and to be able to express uh, the things that they're interested in and their passions because they, they are very socially aware. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I did have one thing that I wanted to do because of sure. Black History um, Month, um, Ruby Bridges. How many Framework of you know who that is? Yeah, Framework Department. Yes. Black History Month <laughs> education is the tool to get seats at the table, to make changes in the world we live, we live Black history 365 days a year. Research shows that when parents and teachers work together, the child seems to do better in all areas. I get real emotional with this kind of stuff. Um, one's work may be finished someday but one's education is never done. White children and black children could not go to, get, go to school together. In 1960, Ruby was in a school of all black children. She loved her class. There was a school for white children only it was called William Francie, Francine, is it Francie, do you know? Okay, elementary school. The government passed a law in 1961. Ruby was the first little black girl or person to ever attend this elementary school. Ruby had to be taken to school by the marshals because they feared for her life. Ruby was seven years old. She was called all kinds of names, and I'm not gonna repeat any of them, and told to go home. White parents took their kids out of the school. She was in the basement with her teacher, Mrs. Henry, let me get her old name. <laughs> Mrs. Henry was her name who was very good with her, taught her reading, writing, and everything that she could. Ruby would hear the kids playing 
downstairs, upstairs, but she could not participate in any of the activities. At one point, the children started coming back to school. Ruby was, ever, was able to participate with them in the activities and they learned about her and she learned about them. Ruby and her teacher to this day are still very connected. They are a family. And I would like to see something like that in this area in Troy. Past due. Thank you. Um, I think for me, the next step is I don't want this to end here. Um, I know that the HRC has talked about uh, a lot about this, but we want to be an asset to Troy City Schools. Uh, we don't want to be an enemy. We want to we want to be able to be a tool um, for the growth and the continued advancement of Troy City Schools. Um, I would like maybe some of your thoughts on how we could be mm -hmm. that for that support for Troy City Schools. I know we've talked about um, writing a list of of diverse books to submit mm -hmm. to the library. I know that they do that every year. They get a, a budget to bring in new books. Um, we've talked about um, we've talked about maybe helping out with poverty training for teachers. We've talked about uh, many things to be able to help the uh, Troy City Schools continue to grow. Great at student government. Like we have community events to do throughout the year. So if they would like to support the community events or partner with us, I think that would be completely fitting. Yeah, I think there's some real opportunity there. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the book list is a great idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think our, our goals match up pretty closely. I mean, the goal of public education is to be as inclusive right. and diverse as possible. Big time. That's what our goal is. Mm -hmm. well, I would just share from the high school perspective, um, now that we've had a chance to share our story, I get a sense that there's a different perspective on some of the work that we are doing. So mm -hmm. um, if you could just help us share that story, you know, information is powerful. And yes. So um, if, that, if that's what you could do to continue to be a partner, um, <coughs> I applaud you for the work that you're doing. And so as you gain information, um, just continue to be a, a supporter and, and a partner of ours to tell that story. I think I think we're doing some really great things, and it's not because of what I'm doing. I think as a district, um, we're doing some really great things. So. And since you asked, I think one of the biggest issues we have in this district, uh, and I mean this when I say this, um, as far as equal equality of opportunity, yes. are the, are the buildings. Um, that's a great part of that building plan, is to become more diverse, uh, more equal across our district rather than having all these different pockets of schools um, that are too small. I know that's a self-serving ask, but it's also a genuine ask. Right. Yes. And I think a two-way street, as I alluded to earlier, we're going to adopt hopefully a, a poster that allows people to confidentially reach out to the HRC if they feel discriminated in. And I think including the school into that dissemination of that information would be very helpful. So I, mm -hmm. I can't I mean, I know you have a board, you have to report to everyone else, but you know, we'd like to present stuff like that to you so that people feel confident. And, yes. and uh, I'd like to invite you guys back. I mean, it's mm -hmm. already almost eight o'clock, so we, and we got you know, a bunch of stuff to do, but uh, I thought it was very insightful and very well done. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the dialogue opened up tremendously from what our perceptions were to where we are today. And, and I appreciate mm -hmm. You, Mr. Piper, and, and the, the teachers and professionals. Too. All I do is bring smart people. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to say, if you're looking for books, um, I would talk to Maurice Sadler yes. at Hayward. He has part of his Christmas present that he keeps building on, and he, he's been sharing his books with me that he has created this incredible library yes. of, of K to 5 books. Um, that celebrate that ethnicity and diversity. And, and so he he might already be able to give you some incredible titles that he owns and is using in his building. He has a very thorough list for I have a bunch too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Big time. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining yes, us tonight. We thank really you so much. We really appreciate it. So can we move on? Yeah. Thank you very much.
You guys are welcome to go and welcome to stay. I'll watch the bomb film in tomorrow. On it, boss. Next up is the great support letter. Troy Foundation. Troy Foundation. Yes. I do not know if anyone looked at the letter. So, it, the signed letter will be submitted to Troy Foundation. This is to obtain grant from them for body cameras for use by the Troy Yeah, Troy I did get that. Department. Good, yeah. So, this letter will be signed by Mayor and Mr. Major. And on February 15, submitted to Troy Foundation. Okay, so next item on your agenda is... Do we need to approve that? I move we approve that that letter go forward. We don't need to approve it. Okay. It's like it's a done. Yes, sir. Good job. So we do need to move on and review and approve the outreach materials. These are very good. Those are ducks. So if you have some suggestions, Todd already had one suggestion, which we all was it? Yes. I moved it. I I kind of wrote this thing, and so what we did is we moved the we serve and the we support. It used to read we support our diverse community by bringing different experiences, and then it said we serve if you experience discrimination. And I just think it reads better if it says we serve our diverse community by bringing different and we support. Yeah. Because I do think that, that that's more of a support to say, hey, we support you and in, in reporting and coming out versus uh, we serve. I just think it reads better. Actually, I think in the original draft, they were kind of there was an arrow changing them, but it just never got. This just kind of got disseminated through a photograph to somebody <laughs> to somebody and it just never made it. So I, I, I think that we, I mean, we don't have to adopt it, but I think it's kind of a good And Mr. Thing. Major also suggested to add QR code on the poster. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'll, yes, link yeah. to the web, web page. Yeah, the page. Yeah. So we will add that QR mm -hmm. code to the list. And the brochure. And the, yes, the and the flyer. Yeah. Yes. Other, other suggestions. Um, where it says mail, email, or phone, can we put something like a call to action? Like, um, if you, you, I guess, in need of support, maybe. So, it, because I, I think it's kind of self explanatory that that's our contact information, but I think we should give them a call to action. Like, if they really need help, if they probably should call us or email us. <laughs> and instead of having the mayor's email there, can we have the human relations group email there? Where it gets disseminated to everyone instead of just the mayor. So we're aware of how we're doing. Yeah, questions? I think, I think it's fine. Yeah. I don't know. Because you're simply just saying it's a call to action. You can mm -hmm. use this number, right? Well, we're, Is that what I heard? Well, I think you have to say one person. And this organization, I mean, I'm always actually good about it. I, I guess the issue is if someone wants to report something, you don't want it to go to nine people. So I, I think that the, the concept was if you, you narratively look at that. I mean, if you wanted to say Jason, safety service director or Solomon, I, I don't, I mean, I, I, I think that's fine. I think those, I don't know, what what would you anticipate doing with an email? How, uh, that's hard to answer. It depends on what the content of the email is, but um, with very few exceptions, those emails are public information anyway. So whether it goes as an all I'm not sure how you would the commission would track this information if it goes yeah. to the mayor and it goes to some sewer inbox. Yeah, the, the important thing is to continually remind yourself that when you get those like email, that you don't quickly answer them. Right. Let us take a look at it, make sure that we know which direction it should go. It should be some of the very sensitive, sensitive and some of the involved. Uh, involved in the police department or uh, an outside agency if the county is functioning or uh, if we're involved in all the technical Would we be able to establish an HRC email account? Yeah. We are having a hurry up. Yeah. That's the one you get. 
the same concept with your Aurora uh, and other types of birds. Just important that everybody wants to be responding to Right, yes. Right. That's the point I was going to make. I think that's certainly that we do need to know uh, what, what the impact is on this, right? Uh, I don't know how we would know that if we left the email in there and said, go on to a. How do we do that? Very fine. Okay. So with the addition of updating that to the HRT email, we'll just get the place. Yeah. And the what did you do? QR code. Oh, and adding the QR code. With those additions, does everyone can just go forward with this post. And then the mail email phone if you call me sent that to a call to action code, like if you are in need of the phone. So should we say you know it would be you know Uh, it's, us to let them know that. If we did that, we'd have to do it on every page. 
so it's just it's kind of a given. Um, we know that you know if they share information that's confidential, then we can redact it. That's why we funnel it all through the one page so that we can get those very sensitive I would like, I mean, I understand what like this changes. I don't know if this changes our rules of procedure, but I really would like to get this out of February only because I think it dovetails into the Black History Month and it shows that, you know, the HRC is really doing something if we want to try to get something out. So, Maybe if we could, if Solomon can make those changes and we can circulate and, and do a withdrawal vote. I would just say you need to approve it. We approve it, okay. So I would move that we abstain, so we approve the salty changes. That way, Ms. Parch could maybe, you know, tie those two events together. And I do think this really shows, you know, I thought the report, I, we haven't talked, but the report was well received by council. Uh, we got some feedback of that, and I think this shows you know, some positive activity reaching out. So I like to move forward. Um, and I'd like to do Um, to be fair, alleged 
discrimination uh, to the story part of that bill. Um, we could make that like a such a bold font so that it stands out a little bit more, so that we can make sure people know that they can find it. Okay. 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 I'll pass that along. What? 